President Higgins, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, it's a tremendous honor and a privilege for me to welcome you all here this afternoon to Trinity College, to the Long Room Hub, our Arts and Humanities Research Institute, to launch our first of our cross-disciplinary research themes on identities in transformation. Just to put it in context a little, the Long Room Hub is one of five flagship research institutes in the college which aim to bring together the best researchers from across the university and to link them with international collaborators in order to address the grand challenges of our times through inter interdisciplinary and innovative research. The special role of this institute is to pioneer cross-disciplinary projects in the arts humanities. And obviously this fine building serves as a focal point for debates that connect the world of academia with the wider public world, aiming really to increase the visibility and the impact of our arts and humanities research, and also demonstrating its relevance for contemporary society. Identities in Transformation is the first of a, new, a number of new overarching priority themes for the Long Room Hub and its partner schools. This theme of identities and transformation is one of 19 specialist research themes that we have in college, where we see that there is a critical mass of world-class researchers that have sca the scale and the resources and the ability to address these big questions that we confront today. And in his concluding remarks, the Institute's director and theme champion, Professor Jürgen Barkov, will say a little more about this specific research program, including its forthcoming activities and the benefits it promises. <coughs> but it is, I'm sure everybody here will agree, a particular privilege that our president is launching this theme. Over many decades, President Higgins has spoken about the role of the universities as institutions of enlightenment and renewal, and he has been a passionate advocate for the arts and humanities in this regard. And so we take great inspiration from his vision as a politician, as an academic, and as a poet. His insistence that culture and the arts can help us to cope not only in adversity, but that they can open up a space for new possibilities for renewal and change in a country like ours is very encouraging. Indeed, in his inaugural speech as president, he called for us to build together an active, inclusive citizenship based on participation, equality, respect for all, and importantly, the flowering of creativity in all its forms. His attendance here this afternoon to endorse this new research theme on identities and transformation is a great source of inspiration for all of us here. And as we develop the different strands through the coming years, we will remember and recall the importance of this occasion when our president came to launch this research theme. So ladies and gentlemen, Uchtaron the Heron, Michael D. Higgins. <laughs> Guinea Cor, or in Gaital Chess, as mean lamb of weakest school, as act and curate cheat, Agasasan Firkin Folcher, Darish of Ruin, eh, Hagenshe Officer and Haynes Ross, a special to their mass locked lane, the Hilskilly, Morris, an atmosphere in Hilskilly, a comic with word and a heel. It gives me very great pleasure to be here in the Trinity Long Room Hub. It's a great mouthful to say as well that Trinity <laughs> College Dublin's Arts and Humanities Research Institute and indeed to launch the institutes and the college's new cross-disciplinary research theme on identities and transformation. When I got the letter inviting me from the provost, he said he uh, invited me uh, to speak to the questions which this research theme addresses uh, and rather 
foolishly, he said, from my perspective. Uh, <laughs> well, it is, a, there are, it is a theme upon which indeed I have a perspective. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting, uh, the discourse that surrounds this particular theme in recent times. It does indeed change. Uh, some years ago, I was part of a discourse on the importance of the arts. And we discussed arts policy. And then this in turn became cultural policy. And then the cultural policy discourse evolved into a discussion on uh, cultural industries. And then it, as other aspects of economy collapsed around the world, it became creative industries. <laughs> and then my last outing, I think, in university in considering this was an invitation to reflect on innovation which managed to drag it all together, as it were. Uh, now, I think this interest in creativity is very much to be welcomed, and I'm very happy to take part in it. I was very, very much pleased to see the wonderful atmosphere that is being created and that is made available to so many brilliant scholars uh, in an atmosphere like this. Uh, research develops this, uh, requires this, and I have such respect uh, for those who pour the energetic part of their lives uh, into significant questions that affect us all. I think when I was invited to offer my own perspective, people were very well aware, indeed, as you say, of the certain the background that I have in investigating some of these themes myself. Uh, I had the great privilege of accessing a university were not available to other members of my family. I had an even greater privilege of teaching in a university at home here in Ireland uh, and abroad. And it was another journey to be made to leave the university and go into the public world of public policy and take responsibility for issues that surrounded the debate as to what culture might be. Curiously, it is a journey that is next and near over, because in more recent times, as I've been speaking about issues in relation uh, to culture in Europe, be it at the Sorbonne, be it at, uh, to UNESCO in Paris recently, I've been re-engaging with these, these, these questions, and I see them as quite urgent. For example, uh, it, it, the theme that I was asked to respond to this afternoon has the general title, The Changing Configurations of Irish cultural identity. Well, the investigation and the configurations of Irish cultural identity have issues, of course, that have to be faced uh, that are local and relations between nature and the local and the poetic, for example. And indeed, further issues are between paesis, if you like, and logos. And I think that in this, it is very, very interesting as well, that Irish people, uh, are, very, are now investigating, have a great opportunity of investigating what I regard as philosophical issues of the first rank. Issues, for example, of volition in relation to choosing identity and debates about the relationship between contested tradition and false distinctions between, for example, what I would see as um, um, mutas and logos. So I'm delighted what attracted me, perhaps, was the word interdisciplinary, because these have not been good decades for interdisciplinary research. They have not been good decades for a generosity of scholarship. They have been poor decades for listening to what might be called, if you like, the intellectual agony of our times, poor decades for responding to the fragmentation uh, of discourse and fragmentation of scholarship retreats, if you like, from deep commitment to fundamental research, disrespect for the community of research and scholarship, the company that people need to each other. As somebody myself who was involved in postgraduate work all those years ago, what is more important even than the finished work often are the terrible moments of doubt that scholars share with each other which far exceed the moments of celebration of a satisfactory <laughs> difference in that. Returning to the theme of culture to which I was asked to make a reflection, I did indeed make a contribution many years ago to the Council of Europe consultation on culture, 
uh, which was published under In From The Margins. It'll tell you of the acceptability of my discourse at that time, that the major contributions I made were through uh, the, the Writers' Union in Sweden and through the Swedish contribution. Uh, I don't recall an invitation to make a contribution from the Irish one at that time. <laughs> but uh, in from the margins became the European regional contribution to what became the United Nations document on creative diversity. In reading our creative diversity and making a reflection, it one is struck immediately uh, by the long history. It is for one of those brilliant scholars to do it, and it, to some extent it has been already addressed in some, some part as to the, why culture is missing, or why it gets such a slight reference in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, for example. There's a long history to that, and people like Professor Goodale and others in Surrender to Utopia have written thoughtfully about it. Curiously, the people who were excluded by, if you like, by uh, Eleanor Roosevelt in drawing up the Universal Declaration were people like the American Anthropological Association and others. For very good and very interesting reasons that are very, that I said, are worthy of consideration. But I'm so glad that it has been taken here uh, in, with, combined as it is with a, a, a discussion on identity. I've engaged with this to some extent myself because sometimes it is assumed uh, that you know, when I look at the, the, the global literature on this, uh, that some people have identity problems and other people have no identity problems at all. Uh, it was one of the assumptions of a long and barren period of literature and historiography uh, that those who subscribe to an imperialist vision had no difficulty with, <laughs> with their identity at all. Whereas that, unfortunately, those to whom address, they address their exploitative and dominating tendencies were people who would go on when they discovered a small space of freedom to immediately have massive identity problems. <laughs> well, I'm very pleased to say that when I look at works like, for example, From the Ruins of Empire, Mokhtar's book and others, and from my visit to South America, if Europe, for example, finds it satisfactory to have a kind of an amnesic relationship to its imperial past, those at the other end of the world have no difficulty at all in remembering what it was like. <laughs> and I think that therefore if we are, if we like, and this is one of the great advantages of having interdisciplinary research, is on constructing such a discourse as will enable what we will come to see later will be an ethics of memory that is able, in fact, to look at this in its fullness. I'm very pleased that, therefore, as well, and is my hope, lest I uh, forget to emphasize it, is to, I would welcome uh, philosophy back into the center of things in Irish scholarship. Uh, I think that uh, we have a very, it's a very ex extraordinary uh, how, to some extent, we haven't used it, it, haven't allowed it to make its full contribution. I think, uh, as well, I've mentioned already the ethics uh, I mentioned the ethics of memory. Professor Kieran Kilhan of University College Cork, while I'm at it, may I say, I hope that the hub is able to work out good, fruitful relationships with other colleges. Mm -hmm. uh, it was rather one of the features of our times that people think that they had, in fact, to put a, a boundary around their own little spot so as to, in fact, attract the attention of those who were not paying much attention anyway to matters intellectual. I think that it is important that there be a relationship between different, between different institutions. Professor Kieran Kilhan's work, a beautiful piece, I remember, on the ethics of memory, in which he discusses, he deconstructs, for example, Helmut Kohl's speech uh, when Weimar became city of culture in 1999. And when, as you saw, provoked all of the interesting choices that are made in the ethics of memory, between Greta on the one hand and Buchenwald on the other, and how it was necessary to leave the communist period out altogether. I think that it is a splendid paper uh, uh, that Chancellor Cole gave, and I, I read it recently in preparing uh, other work. So I think that this question of memory is very, very, is very, very important. Uh, but it isn't, it's very important to realize, I think, uh, that it isn't an inherent Irish failing that we're stuck with memory. We are not, those of us who are interested in scholarship are not asked to choose, as I have said, between tradition and modernity or between mutos and logos or whatever. These are false and arid divisions which don't really bring us anywhere. 
I think that I have to say I'm see, so, so delighted to see old friends here, like James Wickham, uh, who is, I think, a lapsed ethnomethodologist. And uh, <laughs> I remember him in his many different uh, incarnations. And I'm delighted that he has found that he has, in fact, made his way to deep commitment to interdisciplinary uh, research. I think that the uh, institute and its work and its scholarship uh, will be a major contribution, I think, to what we now need in Europe, which is an agenda for living together, an agenda that recognizes, as I have often said, that the cultural space is a much wider space than the economic space. What I have meant about that in the 1990s and building on the work of people like Professor Kieran Benson and others was that, you know, if you're participating in a society and because you lose your job and therefore lose your income, your powers as a consumer, it should not be a disqualification from full participation in the expression of the body or of the mind or with your fellow citizens in what is the cultural space. I remain very convinced, for example, that the future of political economy is within the space of justice and that both will in fact be renewed within the cultural space. So issues of normative issues and issues of ethics are very, very important. I think that I look forward very much as I've met, so privileged to meet so many of the, the young scholars on my way in. I think that a multifaceted exploration of narrative and memory uh, will be very valuable to us in Europe. And it is very, very important for us to, uh, uh, to, to, if you like, relate to each other. I think as well I would like to see uh, a re-entry of, well, we have to really discover fully and, and use it, is, is the, the value of the migratory experience in its fullness in relation to migrants are most interesting because they are, after all, not contaminated, as it were, by property considerations as they move propertyless. They are thrown into the flux of living together, so they have to construct images of the sedentary. Neither are they reducible in an old scholarship to uh, explanations that are at the point of origin or at the point of destination. Their experiences, as pointed out by so many good writers, even if the social scientists failed to do, write about this, our literature always spoke about transients and the life of the migrant, such as people like, going back from Dola Macaulay to people right on to the modern period to John McGarren. I think that we need, therefore, a, a multifaceted exploration, and I'm so pleased that it's, it is taking place. I think as well, in the notion in relation to its mentioned, I think in the letter I received, it suggested it was useful to make this reflection because we were coming up to very significant centenaries. Of course, we are. Uh, 1912, uh, 1913, the Great Lockout, 1914, the Great War, the Volunteers, 1916, and so forth. But it's very important in many cases for us, as it were, to, to decide what it is we are involved in, uh, in such a task. You know, it is as, are we picking at an old sore? Uh, are we seeking a suture for something? Or are we seeking to understand? And this is where philosophy will come into its own. In any self-critical examination of identities on the historical and cultural roots, one I suggest should be open uh, to discovery, to amplification, as well as to revision and adaptation. It is not a contest for false uh, counts, really, that should motivate us, but rather a more humble attempt to understand vulnerabilities and to understand confusion. I think that the accounts that we will deal with are contrary. They are changing, complex, and even contradictory. But then it's time maybe universities reminded themselves about the contrarian tradition and its importance. I think it is critical to develop a, a self-aware then, a sophisticated sense of identity, because it fosters and enables uh, a, an enriching openness towards other people. So I you have heard this is maybe the strongest part I have been seeing in recent speeches is that I have been making the case for what I regard as an integrating normative and emancipatory potential. In the, and that, as I have suggested, truth demands that I say to you uh, in this university as elsewhere, as I have said, that I found that that approach to scholarship has not been favored in recent times. And we have paid a price for it. I've sometimes come down here and I've visited, for example, one of your institutes in relation to debating international economic policy 
It's a place where I announced maybe some of my very earliest uh, reservations on the De Soto model of land tenure. Well, no one knows more than I as I listen to so many discourses of the importance of keeping a pluralist scholarship, of being open to several different models. The choice is rather like this, is that as we look out at our Europe and so forth, we can in fact actually take a model and any part of Europe that doesn't fit into it, we can just ignore it. And we can keep on, as it were, let us say, for example, with a stochastic modeling towards equilibrium theory and markets. And I look at that material. And then you could alternatively, for example, you could take the fullness of our experience with all its problems of unemployment and poverty and disengagement and literature and integration. And you could try and say, I am going to assemble all of the instruments of scholarship and place them alongside me to try and understand in humility one little piece of this complexity and diversity. That's the intellectual tradition of Europe, which we have to recover. And so therefore, I hope that the scholars, in very good conditions and so forth, are not isolated from each other, but are able to access this, what I'd call, necessary moral discourse that is at the, the, the root of scholarship. As I've said, myth and memory play a significant part in shaping communal and national identities, as I've said. But it is very, very important that we pay attention to the ethics and politics of memory, not only to be sensitive to differing and incomplete versions of our own narrative, but also to prepare us to be able to not just have tolerance, but to be able to take into ourselves uh, the cultural filters through which other people make sense of their lives. This is a debate I have spoken about in relation to the universe, in, in relation to the human rights discourse, derechos humanos, where it is very easy to say it is a matter of the world coming up to the standard of accepting our versions of universality. But universality we need in relation to guarantees, in relation to human rights, but it is through the prism and filter very often of different cultures and experience, which is not to put a cultural conditionality on human rights. I hope that the historians, the cultural historians, will have a significant place. I so wish them well. And I very much admire the rigor and integrity of the work of so many young scholars in Ireland now. When I started out myself teaching, we were aligned, for example, for studies of the late 19th century in famine and the North Atlantic experience on wonderful North American scholars. Well, what great pleasure it gave me, for example, in Oris and Uchtaron, to be receiving the, the, new, uh, the new atlas of the Irish famine and to see a whole body of young scholars who had contributed. And I hope that this happens uh, in every area. But really, I think it is time that we realise that quite quietly and with the greatest politeness, said goodbye to the excesses of neo-utilitarianism. Universities are communities of scholarship, but they are not. Universities are spaces of learning pluralist spaces of learning. That is what is important. And I think that often as we go on, and when I, when, we come, when I look at what will come out of all of this work, I hope that it will be able to use Professor Carney's work, for example, who introduced Rick Hare to us, and his important discussion on what might be called a hermeneutical consciousness and a critical consciousness, introducing, as he did us, to, for example, to the work of Gadama and Habermas. These are examinations of memory and cultural narratives to which we Irish have a unique opportunity of making a generous European contribution. And it is the future of Europe to be operating in these intellectual categories. The study of literatures in their national, international context, for example, is so important. In fact, actually, it is the way out of the cul-de-sac of our social sciences in some respects. That we were never able as it were, to look at phenomenological literature, yet we had such a rich source of it, and we chose to place it aside as we all trained ourselves in structural functionalist theories that we had learned elsewhere. As somebody said, the ideological glasses so that we could understand our own people. Mark Fockelstur, in conclude, I also want to say later on today, I'll be visiting the West of Ireland where Court the International Literary Festival is taking place. But it reminds me, for example, of the importance of poetry, the poetry of Seamus Heaney and Michael Longley, for example, which provided me with an opportunity when I visited Northern Ireland, and the poetry of, Hugh, of, of the wonderful John Hewitt as well, which provided me with an opportunity for reflection on a perspective that enabled us to understand so much. So in considering and reviewing our national narratives, therefore, we must do so in a way that respects all of the sensibilities, all of the art forms, and all of our citizens. And I have no doubt whatever 
that the final point which I was asked to reflect on was that we are in conditions of change. It is time that we took charge in a humanistic way of our futures and our present. Uh, we are not in the grip of some inevitable model of change, be it in relation to economy or society. We are challenged. In fact, there is a fine theme in literature that we could pursue uh, with, with, with benefit, and that it is the agony of our times, which is there in music, and it is there in all the forms and all of the arts. But we can embrace new ways of seeing and defining ourselves by drawing on a plurality of interdisciplinary scholarship for the solutions that will serve us best. And our universities, I hope this is why I'm so pleased with that with your invitation. I hope that they bring in, that the universities support and, and bring into being where it doesn't exist anymore, that they be fertile spaces for academic working and that they encourage critical and enriching contributions that the arts and humanities make to a healthy and flourishing society. I remember it so often. I think Professor Weekham will know, for example, when I was Minister for Culture, we were creating jobs in film and music, and people would say derisively, but that's only the arts. <laughs> as if that to which you could flourish as a human being wasn't important why. All sorts of other people had, in fact, been defining themselves as they go, would go on for decades, not making the case so often as they should have for scholarship, but saying, we can be useful if you allow us. We can be useful coming along with the utilita near utilitarian bended knee. I think it is important that our universities lead the debate on the values and attitudes that underpin our sense of belonging and our vision for the future. And they are called upon to play a key role in that. I think in exploring the rich and complex reservoir of imagination and shared memories, the universities can help us combat widespread disillusionment and so much dreadful anti-intellectualism at times in the discourse. They can remind us of what was real lasting value in society, of the many things in Irish life to which all our citizens should have access. Our music, our literature, our sporting tradition, our community values of which we should be proud, but also our successes which we share together, but particularly our vulnerabilities. In making these contributions, your new research team to which you have invited me to speak it offers, I think, great opportunities, a promise of great potential. May I congratulate the director and, and his team and all those that have had the privilege of meeting. I wish you well, and I wish you the exciting and fruitful discussions and discoveries in the year to come. This institute is in the conspose, in chance Your institute is an ideal place to bring together for exploration subject specialist students and young researchers, as well as the wider public. And I very much am pleased to have had the opportunity of meeting those young doctoral students who have the privilege of working here. And I look forward to receiving and hearing of the unfolding narrative of your institute with great interest. Gurumila Mahaki. President, Vice Provost, Dean, colleagues and friends. To me falls the very pleasant and gratifying task to thank you, President, most warmly for your most encouraging and most inspiring words and reflections. I do this on behalf of the steering committee of this research theme, on behalf of the over 70 researchers across many of our schools and research centers who are already involved in related research, and I do this on behalf of the whole university. In your truly inspirational inaugural address in November 2011, you described your presidency as one of ideas and indeed as a presidency of transformation. We have been very privileged this afternoon to partake in the transformative power of your ideas, which have opened up many perspectives and horizons for us that will carry our work and encourage and inspire our work in the months and year to come. We are profoundly grateful for your support and for your endorsement of our research into identities, and especially for your endorsement of interdisciplinarity 
and for your endorsement of the contrarian role that a university has. Today is a day of celebrations, but the work is only beginning. And we are looking forward to the days of doubt as well, to the days of productive doubt. And knowing my colleagues, there will be no lack of sort of uh, challenging uh, each other's and our positions. And that's the great, one of the great things about working here. An important hallmark of this research theme is that it's carried by many individual researchers and research groups around the campus. And I want to take the opportunity to thank my colleagues from a wide range of disciplines. And I just mentioned the disciplines already involved to give you just an idea about the of the breadth of the theme. History, classics, art history, music, drama, film studies, English and Irish studies, literary and cultural studies, languages, linguistics, philosophy, theology, peace studies, gender studies, sociology, psychology, neuroscience, nursing and midwifery, and medicine as well. And I want to thank in particular my colleagues on the steering committee for their decisive and ongoing contributions to the shaping of the theme. I want to thank most warmly the team here in the Trinity Long Room Hub for their tremendous work in the run-up to this launch and for their dedication throughout. I also want to thank most sincerely the college authorities, the vice provost and the faculty dean who are with us today, but also the provost and the dean of research who very much regret that they cannot be here because they are in India for their support of this institute and its work in general and for their endorsements of this college research theme. Before the, we close, let me very briefly give you a quick glimpse of the theme. We have structured it in six clusters or substrands, and you will find more details about those so that I don't have to sort of spell it out in detail and I don't have the time to do that anyway in the brochure that is on your seats. We have a cluster around identity politics and memory contests about which the president spoke. We have one, one around narratives and performances of identity, the crucial role of literature. We have one around migration and belonging in the age of globalization, an aspect that the president also mentioned. One around the self in the digital work and one around somatic identity, the relationship to our bodies, our emotions, concept of an illness and well-being and mechanisms of inclusion and exclusion around it. I also want to mention very briefly some major initiatives under the theme for the next months. The brochure on your seats spells them out in more detail and mentions many others. The most immediate one is that next week we have an international workshop on narratives in conflict here on the 2nd and 3rd of May, and there is a full program in your brochure, and you are all welcome. Details about a major conference and the lecture series are also in the brochure. Please also look out for our website, which was relaunched today with a new look for further details and upcoming events. But the one the one project that I want to mention and need to mention is the Global Research Network Spectris, led by Dr. Jennifer Edmund, the faculty's director of strategic projects, which has just secured over half a million euro on funding from the European Commission. This network, led by Trinity College Dublin, will be investigating how national identities are disrupted by the traumas of history and how societies and nations reshape their identities after political and cultural trauma, such as war and civil war, occupation, genocide, or economic crash. The network includes researchers from Yale, the University of Tokyo, Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, the University of Sao Paulo, as well as from leading institutions in Croatia, Estonia, Germany, and Poland, all countries that at some point in their history and in various forms have had to deal with these cultural and political traumas. It will exchange senior researchers and doctoral students between participating institutions and will also bring them together for a series of thematic workshops. I'm very pleased to announce this major funding success, success today on this occasion, and we are very excited about the new and strengthened collaborations that the EU funding will make possible. On your way in, you might have seen the new bilingual sign of our full name, which has finally gone up on the facade at the entrance. Negotiating identity is a complex process. We experienced that in our discussions <laughs> around the name of the institute and the exact look and format of this sign. We are really happy that the building now communicates its identity to the outside world. And I want to thank all those who helped to make that possible. 
President, as a small sign of our gratitude and as a memory of your visit today, we want to give you a present that has arisen out of research on Irish identity undertaken here in Trinity College by our Department of Irish and Celtic Languages. This book, A Bardic Miscellany, contains 500 medieval Irish poems published for the first time from manuscripts, many of which are to be found here in our library. It thus expresses not only the fact that questions of identities take us back very far into history indeed and belong to the fundamental concerns of humanity, it is also an apt expression of a particular mission of this institute and its associated researchers to help unlock the unique treasures <coughs> of our library. It is part of a much larger project funded by the HEA PRTLI program, which also includes an electronic database. We hope that you, as an Irish speaker and as a poet, will enjoy it and that it will offer some insights into Irish heritage and identity. The book's editor, Trinity editor, our chair of Early Irish, Professor Damien McManus, unfortunately cannot be here with us, but his co-editor from NUI Manus, Dr. Egan O'Rahali, is here. Where, where are you, Owen? There, there, Owen, there you are. So, um, it is with great pleasure and a gratitude much. that I give you this um, little you present. Thank you so much. So, President Higgins, thank you once again for your visit and for your words. Ladies and gentlemen, join us for the reception upstairs, and please be standing for the departure of the President.